All right, so <laughs> this is what I call the holy crap, look at the data statement, right? You've all seen them. It's the first sentence of every abstract of every microbiome paper ever. Continuing rapid fall in the cost of computer components, blah, blah, blah. DNA sequencing is now a fast procedure, available, yada, yada, yada. So pretty standard thing. What I really like about this quotation in particular is that it is from 1979. <laughs> Roger Shadden developer of possibly the first bioinformatics package, which you can still download from the web. So that's pretty cool. All right, so welcome to my talk. I'm going to be talking mostly about microbiomes and mostly, mostly about marker genes. And one, um, so there are two lies that I wish to correct. In the program, it says I'm a Canada Research Chair, but because of incompetence, I'm no longer a Canada Research Chair. Uh, and the other is that Morgan is actually going to be giving the, uh, the read quality and the 16S tutorial this morning. And the reason for that is that his software, Microbiome Helper, is actually very effective for both 16S and for metagenome analysis. And um, it allows us to give kind of a more <coughs> consistent picture. And it wraps things like chime anyway. So it's not like you're going to be missing out on the big standards. OK, so here's what we're going to talk about. Defining stuff, big questions, how to assess the microbiome using 16S, and then the cranky part of the talk at the end. Um, all the limitations of 16S uh, and how you can fall into certain traps that have been fallen into many times before. Okay, so let's define the microbiome. Uh, one thing that's annoying is that there is no sort of canonical citation for the microbiome. There's the, the classic uh, Joshua Lederberg. Uh, and this is kind of summarized. We have the collective genome of our indigenous microbes, uh, microflora, the idea being that a comprehensive genetic view of Homo sapiens needs to in include the genes in our microbiome. Okay? One thing that's interesting is that there are two different definitions depending on how you parse microbiome. So there's microbiome, which is like the genome and the various other ohms of the microbiota. There's also microbiome, which is actually the various tiny things that live inside us. I tend to follow this definition. Uh, basically, the idea of your microbiome is all the bacteria and various other things that live inside you. Either is acceptable, just be clear about what you're talking about. Okay, so, the microbiome, people often, when they say microbiome, they mean the human microbiome. But it's very important to remember that there are other, like, pretty much every habitat on Earth also has an associated microbiome. And this includes soil, this includes seawater, this includes non-human animals. So this is uh, basically people have done studies of the gut and rumen microbiota of uh, herbivores, carnivores, and omnivores to do comparisons, right? Different diets, different functions expected and found. And so there are a ton of microbiome studies done in pretty much every habitat on Earth. Forrest Rower, who some of you might know, has claimed to have sequenced every single virome in every single habitat on the planet which is a pretty bold claim. <laughs> okay, so the micro what? So often, again, people, when they're talking about the microbiome, they're usually thinking about bacteria. But there's actually a lot more to it than that. And actually, we had a question already about bacteriophage, right? Viruses that infect bacteria. So it's important to remember that even if your particular study is focused on bacteria, and there's nothing wrong with that, Keep in mind that, uh, well, maybe. Uh, keep in mind that there are many, many, many other constituents of the microbiome, right? So uh, that other cool domain of life, the archaea, uh, does exist in the microbiome. There are some important methanogens that live in our guts uh, that are often missed by the standard 16S primers. Okay, so that's important to keep in mind. And then various other things, small things to consider: viruses of us, viruses of bacteria. Uh, microbial eukaryotes, very important. Some very important uh, pathogens like Giardia. Um, and then some people also include, you know, overly complex organisms like worms and other types of worms, right? So it's important to keep in mind that there's this big ecosystem in which bacteria are extremely important, but they're not the only piece of the puzzle. Now, trying to characterize this all at once is super difficult, but again, just keep it in mind that everything's there. Jacques already had a slide about this, um, and of course we disagree on the number of genes in the human genome. Actually, I don't care, right? Somewhere between 20,000 and 150,000, so I said 25,000. 
But the key message here is that we have 20-something thousand genes, and if you take a look inside a standard human, typical human gut, you might find two to three million different genes, and uh, quite a few species as well, whatever species means. The point is there's a lot of biodiversity. <coughs> And so one of the important things, and that's presumably why you're all here, is to learn about culture-independent methods. Because we all have a giant pile of guts living in our microbes. I said that backwards. We have a whole bunch of microbes living in our guts. This is being recorded, by the way. Um, but there are obviously some limitations there. And we need to be able to consider approaches that look at things in the big picture. right? And so there's this great plate count anomaly. How many of you have heard of this before? <coughs> okay, excellent, quite a few of you. So the idea here is that if you take all of the microorganisms from a particular habitat and try to culture them, you might be lucky if you can culture 1% of them. <coughs> this statement is patently false for many habitats. And it's becoming more and more false as people come up with different culture techniques, different ways of actually getting these things to grow. Nonetheless, even if everything was culturable, it still would not be practical to culture every single last bug you find in the human microbiome. Some people, like Mike Surrett's lab, are extremely good at culturing a ton of stuff, but you can never be sure that you're getting everything that matters. And the other thing is that there are many ways to do this, right? So um, in, in addition to trying to grow things, there are many different ways, different types of data that you can generate many different types of analysis, and that's what this workshop is about. So one of the simplest approaches to characterizing the microbiome is marker gene analysis. The idea here is that you have all of bacterial biodiversity, and you want to grab onto one thing that everyone has, so that you can target that in a molecular analysis and do comparative studies to try and get at who's living there. And so the most commonly targeted gene is 16S ribosome learning. Yes, exactly, for all of its uh, limitations. Um, and so it's universally present. It's often, but not always, present in single copy. And it has nice patterns of conservation and variation that we'll get at to later on. And the key is that we sequence these genes, and then we use fancy bioinformatics techniques to try and translate the DNA sequences into proxies for the actual microbes that live in that habitat. And so this is from 1985. This is one of the first um, environmental DNA surveys. And these authors looked at a fairly low diversity, super hot habitat. I believe it was in Yellowstone, if I recall correctly, Octopus Spring. And they actually looked at not the gene, but the R, or the ribosomal RNA sequence itself, which is why you see the U's in there. And by doing this, they were able to find sequences that match pretty well to previously known things and also magic new things, which should come as no surprise, right? And so this was the first illustration that this could be quite powerful and effective. So it's all been done before. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, and again, to get hooked up on semantics for a moment, um, the term metagenomics is often applied both to marker gene studies and to the environmental shotgun analysis that you'll be learning about this afternoon. Again, as long as you're clear about what you're talking about, okay. But you should definitely not refer to marker gene surveys as metagenomes around me. Okay. Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. Um, so the key here is that the metagenome term was coined in 1998. And the idea is that the, uh, you want to do some sort of functional analysis of the genomes that can be found in a particular habitat. And so what's interesting is that most people treat metagenomics as a synonym for environmental shotgun sequencing, but that's not where it came from. It was actually based on cloning and expression, but it's the same idea, right? Let's pull out a bunch of DNA, chuck it into some vectors, express stuff, and see what happens. So the use of the term has evolved over time, and now it's basically taken by most people to mean sequencing of random fragments of DNA from the environment. You're still getting at functional ideas by looking at everything you can find, but you're not actually doing the expression and characterization. And that step can come next. And yeah, here we go. Uh, by its strictest definition, uh, it does not encompass marker gene surveys because 16S is not the genome, right? So, you no, know, it's not. Doing this environmentally is not metagenomics. And then, and you will see some of these uh, techniques as well. 
we'll have, uh, you know, you can go from uh, boring old DNA to looking at what's actually expressed in a habitat. And you can say, okay, well, what's the metatranscriptome, right? Which genes are actually switched on in a particular habitat by a particular set of organisms under a particular set of conditions? Metaproteomes, metametabolomes, culturomes. Okay, this is like some of this large-scale sequencing, or not sequencing, culturing. Uh, and then you have more refined techniques like stable isotope probing to try and follow the track of different metabolites as they go on a whirlwind tour of various bacteria. Now, what would influence your choice of method uh, is several things. Obviously, one of the most important ones is cost. And this is one, certainly not the only, one of the reasons why 16S analysis remains probably the most popular approach, I think. Um, reliability. Okay, so that's an interesting one because different approaches will give you data with different levels of confidence. Right? Think about sequencing error. Think about false positives. Those profiles change <laughs> go from one data type to another. Reference database is another example, right? Uh, and then interpretability, which um, this is the part where, you know, we talk for the next three days and hopefully you don't get too depressed. We'll teach you how to interpret some of these things. So big questions. What are some examples of things we want to know about the microbiome that we might try to get at using culture-independent techniques? Well, here's one, the classic who is there. So you take a sample from somewhere, poop, a table, you know, the air, and then you do some sort of culture-free profiling. And as I said before, you can use the sequences you get as proxies for biodiversity. So here's an example. This is the famous uh, Costello study from 2009, where they used 16S to profile about 32 different body sites, right, uh, including. Uh, the gut microbiome, right, for which poop is the usual proxy. Lots of different skin sites, lots of various sites on and in your face, uh, and so on. And you can see with little pie charts there that the colors represent different, uh, in this case, taxonomic classes or phyla. And you look at the skin sites, and they tend to be dominated by actinobacteria. Okay, this was not hugely surprising. Uh, but then the gut samples right here, um, poop samples, are dominated by two uh, families of classes in particular. Bacteroidea is the purple one, and Clostridia is the other one. Okay, so this is fairly typical. Now the ratio of those two phyla can vary, or, sorry, classes, can vary a great deal. Okay. So that's an interesting thing to look out for. So that's taxonomy. What about functions? Well, if you do environmental shotgun, and this is fairly recent results from our lab, where we've taken um, a cohort of elderly subjects in a nursing home and done this sort of uh, gut microbiome profiling. This is metagenomes, right? This is shotgun sequencing. We've taken those sequences and we've mapped them against a highly curated database of antimicrobial resistance genes. By doing this, we can take the database hits, map them to the ontologies, which is basically just the categories of different types of drug resistance, classes of drug resistance, and we can summarize this over our various subjects. And so the key takeaway here is we can look at specific types of function, and we can look at the distribution of abundances across everybody in our set, in our cohort. And so here's an example, uh, cephalosporin. You can see that this is a log scale. Some people have relatively high concentrations of cephalosporin resistance genes, and some people appear to have none. So this is something that's fairly variable within the population. Elthomycin resistance, which is basically never used, uh, you can see everyone has it, and it's a fairly tight distribution, so everyone seems to have it in the same proportion. This is an interesting story that we can talk about later on. It's not actually elthomycin resistance. This will be a good cautionary tale. Okay? Uh, so, and then you can look at something like beta-lactam resistance, right? penicillin, ampicillin, and friends. And it's also fairly abundant, but there's a somewhat wider distribution. So some people have more of it than others do. All right. Other question. What does the microbiome correlate with? Right? We can do surveys all day, every day, but it's not very interesting or useful unless we can start building, identifying associations with different types of potential drivers in the environment. And so here's an example. This is actually from 2006, but it's still one of my favorite examples. Uh, it's not even DNA sequencing. 
But uh, these authors, Spear and Jackson, took, I think it was about 95 samples throughout all of the Americas, and they characterized soil in various different ways. pH, phosphate, nitrate, uh, salinity, you know, quite a few different drivers. And the one they found was the most important, or seemed to be the most important, was pH. Okay. And so pH increases along this scale, and then this is the diversity of the sample, for, for those of you who care, it's Shannon diversity. And you can see that at low pH, uh, this is about four, not a lot of organisms like to live in these, these habitats, because it's a pretty difficult habitat to live in. And then you can see that from there, it increases to a peak at sort of almost a neutral pH, and then as we get to alkaline, we start to tail off. Presumably, if we kept going to like a pH of 10, we would probably have a similar crash in diversity. Okay, so there's one. You can test against various uh, potential variables and identify the ones that matter most. I had to throw this in. Some of you may remember the clickbait kissing microbiome study of a few years ago, where they approached people in an Amsterdam zoo and said, hey, would the two of you like to participate in a study that involves kissing? And so what they said, you have to, you have to, if you look at it, you have to look at the supplementary material. Awesome. <laughs> Basically, a couple of things. Okay, number of kisses per week <laughs> between this couple, right? Versus the similarity or dissimilarity of their salivary microbiota, the microbiome, right? And so the more frequently they kiss, the, greater, the less dissimilarity right, of their salivary microbiome makes sense, right? And this is simply time since last kiss. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the best part of this, this is not relevant at all, but the best part of it is that they asked each the members of each couple to independently describe how often they kiss each other. You have to look at the supplementary material. <laughs> okay, another question is how will the microbiome respond? Again, not super recent, but one of my favorite studies, and it's an example of a bizarre multi-dimensional projection that actually tells a really <coughs> cool story. So the backstory to this is you infect mice with C. diff, as one does, and this, we'll get into this later, this is kind of a two-dimensional summary of biodiversity. So you got like a zillion different bacteria in there, but you can't really project, you can't present that, so you try and come up with a much more efficient, succinct summary. <coughs> Long story short, sick mice are over here. If they have C. diff, their microbiome uh, tends to look like this, okay? Um, and they had four treatment groups, and I should mention, healthy kind of looks like this, all right? So you can see that they are pretty well separated. C. diff infection, not really surprising, right? They have C. diff, they don't really have C. diff. Uh, and then what they did is really interesting. They took examples of these mice, and they subjected them to various treatments. So they were interested in particular in probiotics. And so what you can see is, from the starting point here, I'm not going to tell you. Um, from the starting point here, the progression over days as the mice recover from their C. diff infection. So what's happening here? Well, what did he say? Orange. Orange is simply a fecal microbiota transfer from a healthy mouse. So, Pre-transfer, three days, four days, six days, 14 days. Happy. Okay, how about gray? Gray is a um, sort of a passage, it's one of the passage inputs, which means that they tried to culture the bacteria overnight, and then gave it to mice. Mm -hmm. mice. And so you see a similar progression. Although actually, oh no, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm lying. I dropped this backwards. This is a bacteroides lactobacillus formulation. Okay, which you might be familiar with. And so here's pre, here's six days, here's 14 days. That's it. Okay, that's interesting. This is the culturing overnight, the blue. Pre, six days, 14 days. And then this is really interesting, the last one, mix B. This was taking six bacteria from that passage culture and giving just those six to the recipient mice. Six, a controlled, reasonably well characterized microbiome sample. Pre, six days, 14 days. Last thing I'll point out, you can also treat C. diff with antibiotics, right? Such as clindamycin. Those mice ended up here. <laughs> so, th this is a 
it's like my favorite figure because it tells such a great story with such a usually abused and horrible visualization. <laughs> okay, so, like I said, I'm mostly going to be talking about 16S. Morgan is going to take over the task of metagenomics in the afternoon, but we're going to start simple. So, basic pipeline. Extract DNA. Amplify using PCR, using some set of primers. Filter out the inevitable errors in your sequence. Build clusters if you're feeling brave. And then look at the diversity, similarity, associations with environmental data, as one does with 16S surveys. Okay, so I don't want to dwell on this too much, the sample collection and DNA extraction. There are kits for this. Uh, different types of environment have different inhibitors of DNA recovery. So this is just something you need to write, uh, read up on and you know look at the potential inhibitors and then find the appropriate kit or the appropriate experimental protocol for this. This is great. Um, so in science, we have these things called controls, which are useful. And this is my fan. So, okay. Uh, there was a paper published a few years ago about the microbiome of a particular organ that was thought to not have bacteria in it. The paper was like, oh my god, look at this. We sequenced the microbiome of this. And we found a huge representation of taxonomic group X. Right? And then you're like, okay, that's interesting. And some people pointed out that taxonomic group X was a common contaminant of the reagents that they used. So... Careful, careful. Uh, and it's redacted to protect the, uh, you know. <laughs> Here's an interesting one that sometimes doesn't get considered. Size fractionation. One thing that's really interesting is that different constituents of the microbiome, no, that's not surprising that they have different sizes, right? All bacteria are not the same size. Um, but that if you fractionate based on different sizes, you can get completely different, completely contrasting ecological results. So this is a great example. Uh, looking at an oxygen minimum zone in the ocean, and basically saying if we looked at the 0.2 to 1.6 micron fraction versus the 1.6 fraction, uh, different genes were enriched, which strongly suggests very different ecological roles. Another example, how many of you have seen this figure before? This kind of went, yeah, this went viral last year. This is a uh, Laura Hugg, who's one of the organizers of the Canadian Society of Microbiologists meeting that starts tomorrow. Um, and so this is the candidate file irradiation. Okay, so here we have the archaea, here we have the eukaryotes, which are pushed off to the side, colored uniformly, which I love, and up here we have the bacteria. And so they took those and they added the super tiny cells that they discovered, which they named the candidate file irradiation, and put those into the tree. And these are, these are smaller than 0.2 microns. Okay. So people previously hadn't really found evidence of these because they weren't looking that small. These things are small. They have small genomes. What are they doing? To be determined. What's your PCR strategy? So there's kind of the, the typical somewhat boring stuff like choosing the right melting temperature for your primers. Uh, what sequencer you're using influences the read length that you get. Um, primer specificity, uh, and then, I'm going to talk about this in a moment, and then comparability with previous studies. And Jacques touched on this. Um, and it's kind of, and I'll show you a couple of examples later on that might be the most depressing slides in here, so just, just warning. Um, but Jacques pointed directly to the Earth Microbiome Project and as, as an example of an attempt to standardize the different types of analysis so that, you know, wonder of wonder, miracle of miracles, if you do a study in 2016 and I do a study in 2018, we have some hope of being able to compare them to a meta-analysis and learn something that isn't lies. Okay, so that's good. So this, and I'm sure some of you have seen this before, this is the 16S ribosomal RNA gene, right, which is typically about 1,500 size in length, and these are the different base positions, and what you're looking at here is the different degrees of phylogenetic conservation throughout. So there are some regions, and those are the peaks, that are highly conserved across everybody, right? Especially, you know, for bacteria at least. Um, and then these are much less conserved, and those are the variable regions. And so the common practice is to have primers that target the conserved regions, so that the primers will typically bind to most things, 
and to target, to have the primers converge on specific variable region, re, regions, that should hopefully give you some sense of the diversity within your sample. Hopefully, although it does have its limitations. So this is an interesting paper uh, where they looked at the uh, different types of bacteria that could be amplified using different sets of primers, targeting different variable regions. And basically, long story short, if you use something in the V1 to V3 region, that's kind of five prime end of the 16S gene, you will get an overrepresentation of Prevotelophies of bacterium streptococcus granum, Patella, Bacteroides, Porphyromonas, and Trepanina. It's disappointing. Use V4, V6, you get these ones, and <coughs> often they fail to detect Fusobacterium, which can be pretty important, actually. So that's alarming. Um, and then V7, V9 favors a particular set of organisms as well, right? Uh, and fail to detect Cinnamonas, V7, and Mycoplasma. So depending on your study you're interested in, Missing mycoplasma might be a serious problem. One of the bits of good news is that with the advent of long read sequencing, um, and you know, eventually error rates less than 10%, one can hope, um, the full-length 16S ribosomal <coughs> RNA genes have actually been shown to be quite effective at detecting a lot of things and, as you'll see, uh, differentiating a lot of things as well. Here's another paper. Evaluation of general 16S ribosome RNA gene PCR primers. So these people went and they validated a whole pile of primer pairs, 512 primer pairs, based on 175 primers. They found 10 that worked well enough to be worth recommending. Okay? So this is a pretty exhaustive study. And if you look at the literature, you'll see these standard primers being used over and over again. So at the very least, pick one, which is somehow justifiable in your study, and stick with that. So now, any of the, feel free to interrupt if you have any questions. Yeah. So in terms of the SARS fractionation, what was the suggestion there? Wow. Um, I mean, yeah. it depends totally on what you want to look at, right? The, the habitat. Uh, some habitats, like uh, soil, I think, tend to have many more larger bacteria. Um, whereas other places, um, you know, if you look in the ocean, then you'll have these uh, picophytoplankton, like uh, Prochlorococcus and my other favorite one, Synechococcus. Uh, and so you might want to target a couple of different strata of size diversities. So if you're specifically looking to find uh, name base, your target base. Well, I think, you know, if, if you choose your filters, then you can catch a lot of stuff. So you just have to make sure that you're going to catch the stuff you're most interested in. Yeah? What was the advantage of uh, sequencing uh, two regions, say V3, V4, So you're saying if you sequence two different regions? Is there an advantage of sequencing So basically, yeah, if you have two different loci within the 16S gene that you amplify, you're going to get a lot better taxonomic resolution. Um, it's going to cost more, of course, because you need to sequence every gene in place. <coughs> Sorry, was that your question? Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So was it better apart from the cost? Yeah, it's pretty good. Well, it's, I mean, you're going, to get, you're going to get kind of the union of, well, I'm not sure about accuracy, because you'll still have these biases. You will miss fewer things, right? And one hopes that, at least within a set of primer pairs, the biases are you know, terrible. Okay. I just wonder if the interpretations are using more communities for Okay, so the question is about using mock communities, right, where you have water or whatever medium, and you throw bacteria in at some defined proportions, and then you try and say, okay, what happens if I do various types of sequencing, right, different library preps, different sequencing approaches, can I get the right bacteria in the right proportions? And often the results have been fairly terrifying. So if you think of, I expect 10% of each of these bacteria, because I put in 10 equal proportions, often, I can't remember the paper, I was going to put it in, but I can't remember what it was. It might have been out of John Eisen's lab. Um, Morgan, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I think there was a paper out of John, John Eisen's lab that built mock communities and then tried different library preps and sequencing techniques. It was DNA extraction. Okay, other people have looked at different B regions and also doing shotgun sequencing, right, the metagenomics, and then trying to reconstruct 16S sequences from that. 
and the answers are predictably different. So yeah, it's an important thing to, to keep your eyes on. And sometimes, like I say, the best you can do is try to be internally consistent. Okay, one more, and then I'm going to keep going. Um, just for a DNA So, sorry, you mean in terms of sequencing error? No, like, because I'm interested in more than one thing, but we also want to know at the same time what other things we can do. Like the flanking community right, around exactly. the one that you care about. So, just uh, where can you go and just do standard tests? I guess that we would know. Uh -huh. But I'm just wondering if it's a good strategy or should we just like. Well, I would certainly stick with standard primers, mm -hmm. unless you have a very, very targeted question. Um, other people might have opinions on this, and this will be a great topic of discussion later on. But at the very least, if you're using standard primers, they have known properties. Right. Whereas with, with custom primers, you know, unless you're really worried about missing particular organisms, you know, you can kind of stick to a standard B4, B6, B8, B4, B5, right, something like that. Okay, so steps in analysis. Quality control. Okay. If anything is left after quality control, you can assess the sample diversity. And there's basically two ways to do this. I care about, uh, sorry, I don't care about taxonomy, and I care about taxonomy. Looking at similarity among samples, right? So uh, basically comparing things and saying, how similar are they? Are they similar at all? If they are similar or not, can we associate that with, and this is a horrible word, metadata. Metadata basically <coughs> is taken to mean everything that isn't the sequences. That it's like DNA is the only thing that matters. Oh, by the way, we collected this other crap. Who cares? So often people call it contextual data, environmental data, right? Again, just be clear on what you're talking about. Okay? Because people are never going to agree on this. Semantics. Next, we can also look at machine learning classification. So I'm not going to go into any detail, but it might be a teaser, <coughs> a teaser for Francois's teaser for what's coming on Thursday. A couple of neat examples. And then functional prediction. This segues into something that, hey, Morgan, are you talking about PyCrest? Okay, cool. So it segues into something that Morgan will be talking about, according to him. So there's a couple of standard pipelines. You've seen Chime. Mother is another one. These have been developed by different labs to more or less accomplish and achieve the same goals, but they're done in very different ways. I don't really have time to walk through the details, but the interfaces are very different. And Chime has actually just been updated to Chime 2, which is a massive, massive change. API-based um, I haven't had the time to look at it myself very much, but my people in my lab tell me that it's much, much better laid out, much easier to use, and much more extensible. So that is promising. And then Morgan is going to be walking you through his software, Microbiome Helper, which wraps a lot of the other approaches, both for marker gene surveys and for metagenomes. <coughs> so let's talk about quality control. So when you get sequences, you will get quality scores for each base in those sequences. Typically expressed as what's called a FRED <coughs> score. The FRED score is proportional to the probability that a given base call is wrong. Higher FRED scores are good, lower FRED scores are bad. And so you can have some sort of threshold where you define what constitutes high quality, what constitutes low quality, and then the stuff you can do with that is pretty obvious, right? You can say, if a read has overall poor quality, out it goes. If part of a read is pretty good, the rest of the read is bad, Slice, right, if you want to keep that. Often you'll get ambiguous bases, right, where the sequencer is like, I don't know, G, C, I have no idea. Um, maybe you can accept a couple of those, and the, you know, but if, if a read can, it ends up having a lot of them, you might want to toss it out. Okay. Various different quality filtering tools available, and one important part of this, uh, when you do amplification, uh, PCR amplification of a marker gene, you can often get PCR chimeras, where the front half is from this gene and the back half is from that gene. Uh, and I used to say partial lateral gene transfer, but that's not true. Often it's just an experimental, it's, it's a methodological thing. And so there are several different tools, including UChime, which identify these, basically saying, okay, reference database. This half is similar to this thing. That half is similar to that other thing. Sorry, bud, you're out. Okay. So that's another important aspect of quality control. So FastQC is a very widely used program to do this. Uh, the URL is up there in very difficult to read colors. The basic idea is that, I think I deleted the, okay. Let's see if I can describe it. So it's very colorful. And imagine, if you will, 
a read that goes across the top, right? Position, 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 position. Position, position, position. Here, on the y-axis, you have the thread quality scores. So what FastQC does is over an entire run, it summarizes the quality scores per position, right? So here's a million reads. Position one, the quality score is 36 plus or minus five. That's pretty good, okay? So that'll be in green. But as you go towards the end of the read, you'll see the quality tend to fall off. And so you go into yellow, right? But the quality score is kind of borderline. And then red's like, no. And so the good example is green all the way along, right? Maybe tailing off a little bit at the end. The bad example is a little bit of green followed by yellow, followed by a really long stop line, right? So that's kind of a, I don't know how I feel about this run kind of situation. Okay, so quality control having been accomplished, now we can actually start treating the sequences as valuable things that we wish to look at. One of the questions we can ask is, how diverse are these samples? So alpha diversity simply refers to looking at one sample at a time and seeing how diverse it is, right? which can be expressed in many different ways. So a few different ways that you could consider. One is individual sequences. So you amplify your V4 region, and you treat each unique sequence you get as an independent thing. And you say the frequency of AGCC, AGCC, AGCCC, Dave is 20%, right? And the frequency of this, blah, blah, blah. But there are a couple of problems <coughs> with this. One of the key ones is that you will inflate your diversity because of sequencing error, right? You're going to say this sequence is present in 0.00002% abundance, when it actually is probably just a mistake. Here's the real sequence, one nucleotide away is the oopsie, right? So this is one of the reasons why people do clustering of sequences. Where, and I'm gonna show you the acute little animation in a moment, but the basic idea is that you look at the entire constellation of sequences and you cluster the ones that are similar enough to each other, okay? um, And I'm gonna get into more details. Uh, another obvious thing you can wanna do, taxonomic names are often like a big, warm, fuzzy hug, and so sometimes you might wanna say, ooh, these are bacteroid. Right? These are pre-vitalimus, and so on and so forth. But that approach is extremely perilous, because there's bacteroides and there's bacteroides. Lumping them together can hide a lot of important stuff, uh, so you have to be very, very careful about that. I've got some examples for you later on. So, okay, um, I'd like you to read this, uh, and then if you reach the end, I'm going to assume you consent to this. Presentation of OTUs, operational taxonomic units, should not be taken as an endorsement of the OTU strategy, nor should it be assumed that OTUs have any biological meaning at all. Do not hold me responsible for the use of OTUs. <coughs> now let me tell you how to read it. Okay, so here's the approach. First step for operational taxonomic units, choose a percent identity threshold. So you say, all right, everything that is, every pair of sequences that is at least 97% identical, is going to go into the same ball, right? And so first of all, each of the little blue dots there is a sequence. I should mention that the 97% uh, threshold is very commonly used because it certainly solves most of the sequencing error problems. And 97% is a magic surrogate for species. Although if you look at the uh, Erko Stockerbrand paper from the 80s, and you look at the sort of percent identity and how that maps onto species, you can also simplify the data set, right? Because you can often go from like 1.5 million sequences down to like 50,000. Okay, so it can just make the problem more tractable. Yeah? Sorry, was your comment there that it should be higher? Um, I think the, the, the outcome of the next few slides is that you should not use OTUs. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, there, are, there are much, much, much better ways to cluster that are available now. <coughs> I mean, you don't want to treat everything as real because of those sequencing errors, but there are much, much more thoughtful approaches that you can use, and there's quite a few of them now, and many of them are very good. So, this pair of sequences is 6% identical, so you don't want them in the same OTU. Okay? And so what you can do is say, all right, well, let's find, let's start with some sequences. There are just different ways to choose this, but whatever. You say, this is going to be the center of one of my OTUs. And now we apply this 3%, and it's basically a radius of size 3%. Everything gets sucked in. Okay. Uh, and then you just keep doing this. You cluster things. Um, 
into your time. Now, there are several problems with this. One of, one, one of the main problems with OTUs is that OTUs are not real, right? There is no clean separation of sequences into 97% identity, right? You know, here's an overlap, right? These things overlap. This sequence could be assigned to this OTU or that one. So there are important decisions to be made along the way, which are often mathematical rather than biological. Right? So that's a serious problem. How do we do it? Well, there's a few different ways. One is you can use a big database like, say, Green Genes, um, if you can find it, uh, and cluster against that. Right? So your seed sequences are actually from a reference database that's already taxonomically attributed. And then you take your sequences, <coughs> sprinkle them like fairy dust, and they get clustered. The alternative approach is to use no reference database at all and say, within my own set of sequences, I start with these, and I cluster them. <coughs> One of the recommended approaches is to actually combine the two. Start with the closed reference database approach, pull in what you can, and then whatever's left, whatever hasn't been clustered yet, is treated as new, right? And then you can cluster that in a different way. So this is a hybrid approach, this is open reference. When you do this, you get an OTU table, which is basically across the top. Each of your samples, uh, this is again our nursing home study, is it that really added for this excuse me, example? Uh, so each column is a sample. <coughs> each row is an OTU count. So our OTU identifiers here are helpfully also integers. So down this column, this is actually IDs, this is not counts. But you can see that OTU number 13, there are 88 sequences in sample one, there are 55 sequences in sample two, 166, yada, yada, yada. Now, there are several problems with this. One is that each sample will tend to give you a different number of sequences. So if you compare based on the sequence counts, you're not comparing apples and oranges. Uh, you, you are comparing apples and oranges, right? Apples and oranges, by the way, fall into the same OTU. So the, uh, the thing about it here is that if this is sampled much more frequently, if you get more sequences from this sample than for that sample, you have to do something. So there are a few things you can do. One is that you can convert to proportions. And actually, given the time, I'm not really going to go into the details why. Again, we can talk about this later if you like. Proportions are bad. Um, rarefaction, you can identify this, the sample with the smallest number of sequences and subsample everything else down to that count. So you throw away some of your data. Um, and then there are model-based methods that tend to be a lot more statistically justifiable. Okay? They use things like the variance of the counts to try and get a better estimates of overall diversity. Each of these has their limitations. Okay? Each of them is used, and so, you know, just the best you can do, even if you use one of these, is to be aware of the limitations. Okay? So we can visualize diversity, and basically here we have subject identif identifiers along the x, and then relative abundance of different groups along the y. And it gives you a nice, quick visual summary, whatever your clusters are, of how individuals compare and differ. So you can see here, for example, blue, I believe, is bacteroides, and subject 26 has no bacteroides. <laughs> and so you can start to look for things. Orange is acromansia, of which more later, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay? Now, OTUs, I don't like. Taxonomy, also questionable. So here's another one of these bar graphs, and one of these colors might refer to the genus Acromansia or the species Acromansia mucinophila, whatever. Uh, and then you can say other, other um, groups as well, Parabacteroides, whatever. And then you get all the mystery, right? Because a lot of your sequences are going to map to no known taxonomic group. And that's okay, right? You just discovered things. It's exciting. Um, so how do we assign taxonomy? I'm sorry, I'm very cynical. Uh, so how do we assign taxonomy? a few different ways. One of the most obvious ways to do it is to use sequence similarity search, right? It's 16S genes, everything's homologous, right? So you just use something like BLAST, and whatever best BLAST match you have between your sequence and something in the reference database is what you call your sequence, right? So the best match is to Porphyromonas gingivalis, so my sequence is Porphyromonas gingivalis, using some sort of threshold, right? You wouldn't say, my 16S sequence is 50% identical with Porphyromonas gingivalis. So it's simple, but it's also too simple. Because what do you do if you get matches that are roughly equal identity or E-value, 
to very different things in the database. Right? Different things you can do. Phylogenetic placement is pretty cool. This is where instead of doing this sort of similarity-based approach, you can build a phylogenetic tree of your reference database. Right? You've got your macrolides over here, you've got the Prevotella, whatever, and you take your sequence and you map it somewhere into that phylogenetic tree. That mapping can serve as the basis for the taxonomic assignment. One thing that's nice about this is that it immediately gives you some idea of how precise you can annotate this thing. If it maps into genus Streptococcus, you can say it was probably Streptococcus. But if it joins the tree at some higher level, like class level, you can say, well, I don't know what the genus is, but it's probably class Clostridia. Make sense? Okay, I see heads. Another way to do it is machine learning classification, which is fun. Uh, the Ribosomal Database Project Classifier does this. And sort of, I'm like an anti-visionary <coughs> sometimes. Basically what the RDP Classifier does is it takes your sequence and it breaks it down into a series of what are called K-mers. Okay. A K-mer, uh, K is an integer, K is a number. A K-mer decomposition is simply counting the different sets of nucleotides of length K. So, a, if k equals 2, then you'd be counting the incidences of aa, ac, ag, at, ca, right? So you get this vector, this list of counts for each of those two. Uh, you can go further, you get k equals 3 and so on. The decomposition of this, so that's good because it's fast, it lends itself really well to classifying a million sequences quickly, but think about it. By breaking things down into little counts of length a, you lose all the positional information. You don't know whether this thing was next to this thing or over there, whatever, but it actually works, which was kind of surprising to me. So it's cited some ridiculous number of times, like 3,000 or 4,000. So it's, it's pretty effective as a quick and dirty approach. Here's an example of what it looks like. Uh, so we got two sequences over here, GD, 6J, whatever, um, and it gives you a classification at each rank. So bacteria is the domain level. In this case, the sequence has been assigned to planktomyces, which is phylum level. Um, so you get that level of classification. What's nice about it is that it also uses a bootstrap-based approach to give you some sort of confidence score on the assignment. And so look at the second one, then, right? Bacteria, domain, the confidence is basically 100%. Permacutes is the phylum, 32%. OK, so on there. Plus radio class, 0.26. Often what you will do with this is set a minimum threshold. You might say anything less than 0.7 is out. I'm not going to forget it, right? 19% support. No. Do not call that an aerotruncus or anything else. Alpha diversity. How do you calculate it? Well, simple way to do it is to count your OTUs or count your species or gender or whatever units you're using. And so that gives you what's called species richness. You can also use these information-based approaches, such as the Shannon diversity and the Simpson index, which tell you both about richness and the evenness of your sample. Right? So richness would say 10 and 10. So Shannon would take into account that this has 10 species, but it's 90%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, right? And this one is 10%, 10%, 10%. <coughs> so richness would not distinguish them. Shannon diversity or the Simpson index would. Phylogenetic diversity is fun. That's where you take your sample with all the sequences, build a phylogenetic tree from those sequences, and then sum the branch lengths. Think about what this means. If you have a sample that, for whatever reason, contains only Streptococcus, you're going to build a tree from those sequences, and the sum of branch lengths is going to be very small. Right? So that's not a very diverse set. If you have a, uh, you know, a sample that spans bacteria and archaea, the sum of branch, tree branches is probably going to be pretty large. So that can be pretty important. Okay, here's an example. I won't dwell on this too much. Basically, and this is cool because it looks at different types of data as well. So metagenomics, reference genomes. And these are just different body sites, and you can see, long story short, some are more diverse than others. Right. Okay, well, we knew that. But the choice of diversity measure and the choice of OTU threshold, taxonomic mapping, whatever, is going to be obviously very important to this. Okay, part three. So uh, beta diversity, now you have, you take two samples at a time and you compare, right? So here's sample one, here's sample two. How similar are they? How dissimilar are they? And you can probably imagine in your head ways that you might want to compare them. Turns out there are dozens of ways you can 
Uh, once you've built this, you put each pairwise comparison in a dissimilarity matrix, right? Sample 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, sample 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, difference, 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 difference. Uh, and then you can summarize that matrix using various approaches, such as, I'm sure you, some of you are familiar with this, principal coordinate analysis, right? Ways of trying to cram that matrix into some sort of representation that may or may not be useful. So, given a pair of samples described by, let's say, OTU abundance, calculate their dissimilarity. Beta diversity measures can be non-phylogenetic or phylogenetic. Do I care that the two samples are not phylogenetically very diverse? If I do, then I'll use a phylogenetic measure. If I don't, then I won't use a phylogenetic measure. Weighted or unweighted, do I care about the relative abundance of my different things? Okay? And there's approaches to that as well. And there are a lot of measures. It's ridiculous. Um, Ray Curtis is weighted non-phylogenetic. Descartes is unweighted non-phylogenetic. Weighted Unifrac is weighted phylogenetic. Uh, this is a paper we had a few years ago where my PhD student Donovan looked at a total of 39 different beta diversity measures. This is not a phylogenetic tree. This is a correlation tree. Each of these is a different measure. Their proximity is proportional to the similarity of their predictions. Right? So they'll tend, you know, things like Ray Curtis and normalized weighted unifrac basically give you the same answer all the time. And so Donovan identified several groups that tend to give you different classification types. And so one thing that might be useful if you're looking for patterns is to try one from each of the colored boxes. Okay? Excuse me? Yeah. What do you mean by normalized unifrac? Normalized, um, <coughs> oh God, it's been a while. So it's weighted, so it considers the relative abundance. Oh, what's the normalized? Help me out here. I forget. It, I think it has to do with I think it has to do with the distance to the root. So weighted considers branch lengths, but it doesn't really account for the fact that some leaves are really far from the root. So it tries to compensate for that. I think so it's been a while since I thought about that, and I don't think it's very widely used. Um, sorry, when we use weighted, everything is always different. Uh, then yeah, the way to normalize is the one that. Uh, okay, what do I do with the dissimilarity matrix? So this is that projection where you take your complex dissimilarity matrix, which is based on all that taxonomic stuff, and try and project it into two dimensions. <coughs> so this is comparing the gut microbiota of three different populations, um, US, Amerindians, and Malawians, and you can see that on some axes of differentiation or diversity, you can separate this population from that population, but if you look along that axis, they're actually really not very differentiable at all. And then there are different methods you can use to say, okay, this is principal component or principal coordinate one. What does it mean? Right. And you can look at different ways that the taxonomic groups feed into that dimension. And that can give you some clues as to what's really differentiating those groups. From a matrix, you can also do hierarchical clustering and say, yeah, these are pretty similar. These are not. And there's different techniques to do that. UPG and for example. All right. Different beta diversity measures can yield dramatically different uh, results, and I'm not going to uh, dwell on that. There was a figure, but it disappeared again. It's like uh, associations with metadata. Okay, so you've got two diversity measures. Now what? Well, one thing you're probably interested in is how does the diversity of the microbiome vary with salinity or temperature or how recently a cow walked over a spot, right? And so you'll take your diversity information. And you'll take your metadata, or whatever habitat information you have, and you'll use some kind of technique. And these are some fairly widely used ones. So ANOVA, many people are probably familiar with. Permanova <coughs> is simply a, a non-parametric, there you go, permutational-based one. You can look at similarity approaches, the Mantell test, which I'll show you in a moment if the figure survived it. Uh, so one of the simplest things you can do is take a particular taxonomic group, operational taxonomic unit, you know, whatever, and regress it. So this is the abundance of a particular OTU. This is some metadata. In this case, it's the frailty of the subjects in our nursing home study. And you can fit a line. You can say, well, OK, there's a positive relationship. You can put a p-value. In this case, the p-value is like 0 0.001. And then you can look at the plot and say, but is that useful information? 
always need to consider residuals and effect size as well. You can do ANOVA to compare different categories. So this is actually the abundance of a different function in people who are 60, 70, 80, or 90 years old. You can do your, your ANOVA test and get a p-value. Left C from uh, Nicholas Sagata and Curtis Huttenhauer's group is really cool. This will tell you which taxonomic groups mapped onto a tree are overrepresented or underrepresented, relatively speaking, between two different samples. So red are overrepresented in one type of group, green are overrepresented in the other type of group. And then there's other stuff. Mantel test is a different type of regression. Again, I'll just leave it there. We can talk about it later if you want. Machine learning classification. You know what? I'm going to hand this off to Francois Levy with that. Um, basically, they can be, they're really powerful and really useful. But there's like a billion different pitfalls you need to consider. So um, this is one of my favorite studies. Well, one of my own like, favorite things that I've done in my life. Um, and it's using something called uh, support vector machines and random forests to distinguish super digital plot communities from sub digital plot communities. Um, and using not just OTUs, but a more phylogenetic based approach. Um, I'm just going to leave it there. There's a classification accuracy of different approaches. Functional prediction. This one's on Morgan. Take your 16S, take a reference database of genomes, and try and predict the functions in the metagenome from your 16S. Almost there. Almost there. Um, okay, problems. The complaining part of the presentation. Data quality is obviously a problem. Sequencing errors can be introduced. And of course, it's proportional both in percentage and in type of error, depending on your sequencing platform. Chimeras I've already talked about. Rar. Um, reproducibility. I've already talked about this, too. Different variable regions can give quite different results. Ditto goes for sequencing platforms. There are papers showing all of this stuff. Um, and then, you know, there's a bunch of different tools and your choice of workflow is going to influence what comes out in the end. So this is from a mouse frailty study we did a few years ago. And this is interesting. We had young, middle-aged, and old groups of mice. Okay? We didn't have very many of them, so we're like, okay, can we use sequences from reference databases to build up our own data set, right? And so we did this kind of similarity ordination approach, principal coordinate analysis. And this reference <coughs> set was actually microbes from six different strains of mice that were published in a previous study. But look at what we get. Our old are differentiated from our middle-aged mice, are differentiated from our young. We were hoping that these would be kind of reference middle-aged mice, but they all fall in there. So the two studies are not comparable, which is why this is not in print. This is cool. Again, I, okay, the, the figure disappeared again. The basic idea is that 16S is only one option. Uh, you can use others that are more highly variable. So the intergenic transcribed spacer sequence is an example. People have used that specific one to find very interesting patterns in the ocean within a single species that would not have been detectable at all using 16S. Okay. Tread carefully. Uh, okay, taxonomy and OTU suck. Um, what else you got? OT, so this is this is coming out of uh, Mike Hall, who's a PhD student in my group. He has developed an algorithm and software called Nanki, which clusters sequences not based on sequence similarity, but based on their time series similarity. So two things tend to go up and down all the time. They'll be assigned to the same time series cluster. So here's a time series. This is lakes, in, uh, one particular lake in Wisconsin over 11 years. The data set was collected by uh, Katrina McMahon. And this is if you do OTU clustering of the sequences. You get this pattern. It's, 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 it's seasonal, right? Spring, 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 spring. But if you do time series clustering, if you look carefully, you can actually see that this OTU is close to two. One part of it, one time series cluster, comes up predictably a week or two before the other one. So what have we lost by clustering into OTUs? A lot. So this is taxonomy. I think I'm pretty close to the end. Yeah, two more slides. Um, and so what you're looking at here is more time series clustering of our nursing home subjects. And each color represents a different time series clustering of acromantia. So orange is acromantia mucinophila, red. And notice how different subjects have different types of acromantia. And even within subjects, different types of acromantia have different temporal behaviors. Are these things ecologically the same? Should they be treated as the same thing in the analysis? No. They're all the same OTU though, right? So this is um, this is potentially a problem. 
Last example, biological relevance. Here's a microbiome sample, 99.9999% is belongabacter, right? And then 0.0001% is accidentobacter. So does this thing matter? We found it in the sample, and if you sequence deeply enough, you can probably find almost everything, but where do you draw the line in terms of biological significance? Right? And so this is a very complicated question. So summary, many ways to do it. Market gene analysis is widely used and relatively inexpensive. Hey, we do it. We do occasionally use OTUs as well. Uh, and then there's a bunch of limitations, right? What can we do? Well, that's the rest of the presentation. So just to finish off, you can sequence the microbiome of anything you want, and people have. Children's inflatable poops. Chicken poop, thanks to John. Uh, we've got squash bugs, right? We've got kimchi. Who likes kimchi? Um, statues, right? People are interested in degradation of statues. Uh, roller derby, right? Skin to skin contact and roller derby. Donkeys, but not the whole donkey, just certain parts of the donkey. Uh, so, and somebody asked about power calculations and so on. So I just found this online. I haven't looked at the web server yet because the internet was down. But I think this gets at what somebody was asking about. Thank you. Yeah. The compositionality nature of the data. Yes. Uh, so you uh, listed some of the methods that we would not be used, but are they applicable to compositional data without transformation? I think so. The question is about compositional data, and this is a problem that comes up, for instance, when you convert your counts into proportions. Right? Because by converting into proportions, you lose the degree of freedom on your data. Everything is now constrained from sum to one. And people have shown that certain types of uh, analysis, one thing I didn't talk about at all, believe it, is uh, co-occurrence analysis, right? So if you run co-occurrence analysis on compositional data, you are going to get a lot of spurious results. So again, some of these problems can be remedied with other types of approach, and some of them can. And again, there's like 15 different ways to assess co-occurrence.